This is Life Rewired, the Brain Injury Podcast, for survivors, by survivors. And now your host, Rob and Ashley. Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Ashley. And this is Life Rewired. Today we have joining us Beth Luconti. And Beth, I believe you are going to tell us today about your daughter who was born premature and you were able to discover that she had a an acquired brain injury or was it it, it was, was just a brain injury at birth it was an injury that occurred at birth okay so beth give us your story and then when you're finished we'll give you some questions so you have the floor go for it sure thank you so much for having me it's great to be here yeah. um so i am the mother of a 17 year old daughter And when she was born at some point during the birthing process, she acquired a TBI. Um, We don't exactly know what happened um, because she wasn't diagnosed until she was 13 years old. Um, She was born approximately 10 weeks early. And due to the fact that she was premature, all of her, um, what do I want to say, all of her symptoms they related to her being premature they were just like oh she's a premature baby so she'll grow out of it everything will be fine um and kind of as the years progressed she wasn't growing out of things um her tbi specifically um occurred in her cerebellum which affects your motor coordination and your sequencing um so there's things like math are very difficult for her because it involves a lot of different steps um Mm. she's a person that we have to give one or two steps to and then let her get through those steps and then we add more steps if we if we do the multiple step thing three four five six steps in a process she doesn't remember or she uh she'll mix the steps up um and that's part of her tbi Mm-hmm. Her fine motor skills are still not quite um, as up to speed as somebody who is an able-bodied person who's 17. Um, her, like, for instance, her handwriting still looks like maybe she's in, you know, second or third grade, things like that. Um, her gross motor skills have increased um, and gotten better as she's gotten older, but she still definitely has some issues in that respect. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, when she was born, she had 10% range of motion on her left side and only 15% range of motion on her right. So she mm-hmm. was in physical therapy by the time she was four months old. Um, we have been in and out of physical therapy to this day. Just depends on, you know, if she's struggling more or if things are, um, if her muscles are responding better, then we'll come out for a little bit. But then if they tighten up and she starts having more problems with her coordination, we'll go back in. Um, so for her physical therapy is probably something she'll have to do off and on um, most of the yeah. t- most of her whole life. Um, and then what do I want to say? So due to her um, just persistence and wanting to um, get better and, and, and be able to do things that other people do, um, maybe at the same level as other people do. She's just been really phenomenal about engaging in her physical therapy. And then once we found out she had a TBI engaging in finding the roundabouts and the alternatives so that she can be successful. Um, and I just really have to honestly, like, I'm really, really just excited for her personality about wanting to go and, and, and get her dreams and follow what she wants to do um, yeah. and make it happen. So, um, and That's can awesome. I talk about the figure skating piece? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so part of one of her dreams and one of her loves is figure skating. When she was three years old, she literally looked at me and said, I'm going to do that. And I was like, okay, whatever. I kind of laughed about it being, you know, kind of the dorky mom. Um, but she told her physical <laughs> therapist at three years old, she goes, I want to figure skate. So she spent the next four years, um, doing everything that they said she had to do so that they finally said at seven years old, they said, okay, you can try now. So at that point I felt like, who am I to say no, right? This kid just worked for four years (laughs) to get herself on the ice. And so I said, yes. And it's been 10 years now. (laughs) I don't know why I said yes to figure skating, but it's been 10 years now. Um, and in that 10 years, she has, just really worked to improve her skating. And it's a love that she has approximately three years ago now, U.S. figure skating and I talked about the fact that we did not have a para-athlete program for U.S. figure skating. I know, that's kind of shocking. 
Um, yeah. So my daughter and I helped and are still helping develop that. So other people who have physical disabilities have a place to skate um, if they want. Um, and then outside of U.S. figure skating, there's an organization in Europe called Inclusive Skating, and they have been um, in place for over a decade now. And they have actually a world competition, just like able-bodied worlds. Um, and Daisha has been able to skate in that, and she has um, actually become the four-time junior world champion. That's because amazing. Because of her determination and just her love for the sport and um, for me, it's just awesome to watch her do something she absolutely loves to do. Um, yeah. Despite, right, all the extra stuff she has. She has the physical therapy. She has the extra stretching before she can even get on the ice that a lot of kids don't have. Um, I mean, there's always prep, but she has more prep. And her just wanting to do that and just love for it. So, anyway. That's awesome. I really love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it. Just your your disability does not define you. Mm -mm. Nope. No. And the fact that she has to work even harder yeah. than the other girls, and she's so successful at it. That I mean, that has to do your heart great. Um, it's interesting. Um, we actually just went to Worlds for the first time in person, so she got to meet all the people she's been skating against virtually. Um, and they were so amazingly welcoming and just fun to be around that when she talks about going to worlds, she doesn't talk about her placement. She doesn't talk about how well she did. She talks about the people that she met and how fun it was. And for me, that was honestly the best thing that could have happened. Um, yeah. Her skating skills are, are, you know, I think really great for her situation. Mm -hmm. um, and all the girls that we were skating with were phenomenal. Um, but for her to come out with a sense of belonging for the first time um, was, to me, that was the best thing. Uh, we don't yeah. have anybody that competes at her level here in the U.S. yet that we know of. Um, so she's always the only one in her event. So that was really phenomenal. Yes. I love to hear stories like this. Mm -hmm. I really do. It, it gives us so much more hope and to know that if you just apply yourself and just never give up, mm -hmm. you know, and Beth, I think you might be the first caregiver that we've had on our program. Okay. So I am so excited to have you on here as well, because we've been wanting to do a program for quite a long time where we get together with a couple of care caregivers to, we want to get their insights, you know, mm -hmm. We know what it's like with our spouses living with us. Mm -hmm. There's so many people out there that don't have anybody to yeah. take care of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've said it from the beginning that the caregivers are the young son heroes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> because my wife, God love her, because I know I put her through it. And I don't know how she does it. I mean, she's an angel. So that's why I say that it's. I mean, I might be being sappy, but that's how I feel. <laughs> so what, um, from your perspective, mm -hmm. I mean, I know you, you don't know what your daughter would have, would have been like pre-accident because, mm -hmm. you know, as a care, most caregivers, they know what their spouse or children was before the injury, mm -hmm. but you, you had to go into this full force. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your perspective, I guess, on being a caregiver? So I think that it comes with its challenges, but I also mm -hmm. think it comes with its joys. Um, I, like you said, I don't know um, a different side of my daughter had she not had the TBI because she was born with it. So we, yeah. you know, she literally came to us <laughs> and we we've had that situation since day one. Um, and, but not knowing exactly what it was till she was 13, that part was difficult, right? Cause you're trying to advocate for your kid, but you're also like, for me, not trying to sound like a mom who just, just making something up. Like, I don't yeah. want, you know, people, I've had people tell me, well, you just want your, you just want your daughter to have a problem. You just want her to be sick or you just want her to whatever. And I, I didn't, um, I just, when you're watching, developmentally and she's not fitting with her age group, mm -hmm. um, you can see something is different, you yeah. know, um, her interactions with people, there was this whole pause, like 
um, just she'd sit there and look at you like with just kind of this blank look. And, and that was because the processing delay that comes with her injury. Um, so when you're the caregiver, you're noticing these things, you're living with these things. Um, you're noticing them in different settings, right? The school setting yeah. for her, also the skating setting, just different settings. Um, and there's a line between advocating and people then just thinking you want something to be wrong with your child. And that was something we dealt with yeah. for a long time. Um, and then interestingly enough, after her diagnosis came, then we dealt with, well, she's not injured. She's, she doesn't look bad enough. Like we hear that all the time, like, cause she has a milder injury and I understand that, yeah. but you know, she's not injured enough is what we'd hear. Um, and I find, I find that really strange that, yeah. you know, cause there's a whole spectrum of, of injuries, even oh, yeah. outside of TBIs, right? There's a whole spectrum of things that can Absolutely. happen. And I find it interesting that people are almost judgy about where you're at on the spectrum. And I think mm -hmm. that's true from people who have maybe a major TBI to people who have a minor TBI yeah. um, or milder. I do. I find the yeah. judgment interesting. Um, and then as a caregiver of a child, there's judgment about how you parent your child. Um, the yeah. school um, was very difficult at first because they would, we have a 504 for her because her injury is technically a physical injury instead of an IEP because yeah. we don't have an intellectual delay. So I have a child who has a 504 for a processing delay and an auditory processing is the most difficult. So she needs mm -hmm. things in writing, but then she's in AP classes. So I get mm -hmm. teachers who are like, why are we doing this? She's in an AP class. And I'm like, they're two different trying to educate is a big part of my role, trying to educate what the difference is and why she needs what she needs. And I find, I, th I think that a lot of caregivers might be in that role where there's that education piece for people yeah, and, um, and just trying to educate in a manner that is helpful for the person you're interacting with. And then also for the individual with the TBI. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also letting them advocate for themselves on some level, right? Cause you have to teach them. Yeah how to advocate for themselves. Cause you're not always there. And, um, like my daughter's going to go to college. That's her dream. And I want to be the person who supports her in that dream and then figures out how to make it functional. Right. So yeah. she's going to need things in writing. She's going to need this, just some functional things to make it work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big part of being the caregiver is learning those lines and those boundaries and, you know, and working with people's judgment about, how you approach yeah. or how somebody else approaches it. I think the judgment is the part that everybody caregiver or brain injury survivor, mm -hmm. they, we all deal with that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. You nailed it on education mm -hmm. there. I mean, doctors that doctor people for brain injuries that have a clue what it's like to be, yep. you know, living with a brain injury. I agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> completely agree with that. I've had some, well, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've said it before on the podcast and I'm sure people are tired of hearing this be say this, but my first neurologist, after I hit my head, he was God's gift because he would tell you he was, but he got so mad at me because I couldn't remember my birthday mm -hmm. and he slammed his pen down and he said, the questions are just going to get harder from here. Mm -hmm. And this is a neurologist. Yes specializing in brain injuries yep. who has no reason to be uh, dealing with people in, in our situation. So, yeah. When we were first told that it was a brain injury of some kind, they, uh, the initial neurologist was like every lobe's affected. And we were like, I don't think so because Unfortunately for my daughter, I'm fascinated by the brain and I've been fascinated from, by the brain since I was a teenager. So I'm always like looking things yeah. up and I'm not a neurologist by any means, but I know some things. And I was like, there's no way every lobe is affected because other things work fine, you know, and I know enough to know what lobe does what and things like that. She'd have had to have a heck of a brain injury too. Right. To, and that's very you know. uncommon to have one in that massive of a, oh, yeah. of a, of an injury, so to speak, especially, um, like ours wasn't a car accident or something like that. It really occurred at birth. Um, but what's interesting about that is, um, I started calling children's hospitals and I was literally denied 
by four different hospitals before Boston said, of course, we'll see her. They were like, we have no idea what to do with her. That's what I would hear. And I thought to myself, you're the children's hospital in the neurology department and you have no idea what to do with my kid. Mm -hmm. It was so bizarre to me that just even in the medical field, like you said, there's those judgments and those walls and just trying to get the help that, you know, you need is difficult. You know, and being an advocate is the key because my wife did the same thing. She said, if we have to get you to, because we live in uh, Southern Indiana, Mm -hmm. she says, if we have to drive all the way up to Indianapolis, we'll go there. You know, where Tennessee, I don't care where it's at. We'll mm-hmm. get you the help you need. So she did a lot of grunt work, but she found somebody to help me. That's yeah, that was my role, right? I was the person who, who started calling and do that. So we actually ended up driving from Colorado to Boston twice. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and that was the other thing is Boston finally like gave us some answers and talked through it and it, things made sense. And, and, and not only did they make sense to me, but they made sense to my daughter. She was like, Oh, oh, I see that now. You know, she was able to put together her experiences with the conversation the neurologist there was telling us. So when it came down to doing the neuropsych and kind of maybe getting more fine tuned on what's going on, um, we talked about where does she want to go? And she looked at me, she goes, I'm going back to Boston because they're the only ones that believe me. And I thought that was super powerful. Yeah. And I said, okay. So we went back to Boston and did the neuropsych. <laughs> we flew the second time. <laughs> <laughs> And and she has to be comfortable with the care that she's getting as well. I think that's so important. And I think that as a caregiver, it's important to listen. What is the comfort level of the person who really has the TBI? Because I'm a big fan of being comfortable with my uh, medical team. So if my medical team isn't her medical team, that's okay. Yeah. So just deferring to that and making sure that she's in a space where she can get the help she needs and she's comfortable so that she can mm-hmm. talk about everything that needs to be said. Yeah. Cause I don't talk about things when I'm not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't either. I bottle it up. <laughs> right. Actually, I don't want to steal the spotlight. Did you have things you wanted to ask as well? Sorry. I was trying to find the on mute button. No. Um, <laughs> very thorough and uh, that's wonderful that she's you know able to do the um skating and that she's able to help you know set up the league for skaters you know like her and uh, just you you should be very proud thank you yeah i can tell that she's a really proud mom and and (laughs) she has great reason to be I think I'm just most excited that she just wants to open doors for other people. Like she talks about that all the time. I just want other people to know this exists and they too can come. So that's wonderful. I, I love her passion. I really do. Yeah. I love her willingness to be the first, like that's hard. (laughs) Yes. That's hard. Yes. Cause I mean, is at my age, I still, I'm still shy. So Mm -hmm. I, you know, if I was in her shoes, I wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that speaks volumes for her. If I was in her shoes, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just in the background. I just do her hair and makeup and shove her out there. No? <laughs> well, I think that does speak to the support that you've given her over the years. So, you know, you didn't hold her back and say, no, you have a brain injury. You know, mm-hmm. you encourage that. I think that's, that's important for caregivers. Like, yeah. Um, and I guess I think about it sometimes my husband and I were talking about this, like, how do we have known at, you know, three or four or five or six or whatever age she was, would we have let her skate? And we're like, yeah, we would have, because she was anybody who puts four years into somebody saying, yes, you can finally get on the ice. Why would I say no? You know, and I think that's important. Like people have their passions and, and some people are, you know, fantastic writers or poets or, you know, artists or mm-hmm. any of that. So I feel like that's important um, for any person, even people without a disability. Let's support their, you know, let's support them yeah. and support their loves and their passions and, and help them. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So. What advice would you give to people who, um, see if I can figure out a a way to word this correctly, 
Um, so for example, the, you know, you're a caregiver of someone with a brain injury and sometimes they do things that you're like, but you've done it right all this time. And now all of a sudden, I'm sure you've seen this. Oh, it's daily. Yeah. You know, like my wife will say, that doesn't make sense why you did that. <laughs> like, you know, when you're a brain injured person, you, what makes sense today or even what made sense an hour ago, maybe won't make sense now. Mm hmm. So what would your advice be to, to caregivers, how to deal with those situations? How, how have you dealt with it? Um, so I'll be completely transparent. There are days that I am absolutely human and an idiot. And I have to be like, oh, I did not do that well. Because, <laughs> right, like, I'm not, yeah. you know, we're not perfect by any means. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. But when those moments happen, I come back to my daughter and I'm like, okay, obviously I did not manage this well. Let's talk about this. And I can own that. Um, I can own that I'm human and I can own that I absolutely make mistakes. Now, there's other times that I'm doing a great job and not blowing it as a human being. Um, and so when we have those moments, a lot of times for me, it's just making sure that I consciously remember that those moments are by far not intentional, right? They're not intentional yeah. on the pers on my daughter's part by any means. And then there's moments that I have to consciously sometimes still remember the connections aren't getting made. You know, um, the input is coming in. Sometimes it hits the damaged area and sometimes it doesn't actually make it around to go mm -hmm. to the rest of the brain. Sometimes it hits the damaged area and there's a pause and it goes around. And then other times it misses because it's a partial injury for her. So sometimes it, the neurons miss the, um, the damage. And those are days that like, right, everything looks good and everything's smooth and we remember everything and she's getting it done. And then there's the days where it hits and there's the delay. And then there's the days where it hit and it never makes it past. <laughs> and so, um, that's the easiest way I can describe it. Um, it's like a roundabout and you don't always get around it. Um, and just consciously remembering that that is really, truly, uh, something that she has to manage and she has to deal with. And, and I don't know what that feels like for her. Um, yeah. I don't know what it's like to live every day knowing that yesterday I did all that and it was fine. And today for the love of Pete, I cannot remember why it's not working. <laughs>